Number 10. Rutherford B. Hayes was the second of the seven Ohio-born presidents elected between 1868 and 1920. Prior to his presidency, Hayes served as a member of the House of Representatives for two years, and then later as governor. He was the first Ohio governor to be elected to a third term. Number 9. Hayes' father died ten weeks before his birth. His uncle, a lifelong bachelor who lived with the family, became his father figure. Sardis Burchard was a banker and businessman. Hayes learned professional skills from Burchard, and the two maintained a close relationship until Burchard's death in 1873, three years before Hayes was elected president. Number 8. During the Civil War, Hayes served in the Union Army. On numerous occasions he was injured, such as being shot in the shoulder, having a horse shot out from under him, and even having a spent round strike him in the head. General Grant said his, quote, conduct on the field was marked by conspicuous gallantry, as well as the display of qualities of a higher order than that of a mere personal daring. He'd eventually achieve the rank of Brigadier General. Among those who served under Hayes was future President William McKinley. Through the war, the two of them formed a lifelong friendship. Along with McKinley, Grant, and Garfield, Hayes was one of the four Ohio-born presidents to serve in the Civil War. Number 7. In personality, Hayes contrasted with other Republican presidents of the era. Melancholy had loomed over the life of Abraham Lincoln, and Ulysses S. Grant was exceedingly shy. Hayes was generally known to be happy and perpetually optimistic. One biographer wrote of Hayes, quote, He was never a solitary, a boy of moods. He had no seasons of exultation followed by depression. All his life he liked society and shone in it in a modest way. Not sparkling, not brilliant, but pleasing, satisfying. When it looked as though he'd lose the presidential election, Hayes contented himself in the fact that he could leave the stressful life of politics and spend more time with his family. Even when grieving Lincoln's death, he took comfort in knowing Lincoln would be remembered as a martyr. Number 6. Hayes' election to the presidency in 1876 was one of the most contentious in United States history. Tensions were high due to Southern resentment over Reconstruction. Not helping Republicans' chances was that during the Grant administration, party corruption had become rampant. Democrat Samuel J. Tilden won the popular vote. 4.2 million to 4 million. Hayes won the electoral vote, but only by a single point. 185 votes to 184. The results in many key areas were so close that a special commission had to be tasked with deciphering the results. Though the electoral commission was bipartisan, with seven Democrats and eight Republicans, Democrat voters felt cheated. They were convinced the Republicans were too afraid of a Democrat victory. There were threats of violence. Hayes' residence was fired upon, and some even talked of a second civil war. Many Republicans were in fact afraid of a Democrat victory, especially only a decade after the war's end. The issue was resolved through a backroom deal, the Compromise of 1877. Hayes was allowed to obtain the presidency peacefully, and Reconstruction was effectively ended. Historians still aren't sure if Hayes actually won the electoral vote. There may have been scheming on the Republican side. Also noted, however, is that the Southern African American vote, which would have went for Hayes, was suppressed through violence. Between meddling from both sides, the true results of the election will likely never be known. Number 5. The Democrats and the South weren't Hayes' only source of strong opposition. The 1870s were a time of factional divide in the Republican Party, between the moderate half-breeds and the radical stalwarts. Hayes was a half-breed, meaning he supported civil service reform and more lenient handling of the South. This put him at odds with the stalwarts, or the old guard, who were completely willing to strong-arm the South if it meant more civil rights for African Americans. Stalwarts were also staunchly opposed to any kind of civil service reform, being benefactors of the old spoils-based system. In contrast, Hayes and the half-breeds proposed civil promotions be merit-based. The stalwarts' leader, a powerful and aggressive senator named Roscoe Conkling, was already bitter towards Hayes over the Republican nomination. Because of this, 
Conkling had refused to campaign for Hayes. Considering his influence, it's likely an endorsement from Conkling would have led to a cleaner path to victory. The stalwarts stood in the way of civil service reform at every turn. At one point, Hayes passed an executive order making it so officeholders didn't have to take part in party politics, encouraging his ideas of a merit-based system. Prominent stalwart and future president Chester A. Arthur simply ignored the order. Hayes fought an uphill battle against the stalwarts in his four years. Though without many gains, he laid the groundwork for his longtime ally and successor, James A. Garfield. Number 4. Months into Hayes' presidency, he was confronted with the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. Railroad workers were going on strike by the thousands in response to repeated wage cuts. Violent riots broke out in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Maryland, causing Hayes to send in federal troops. After 45 days and several violent altercations, the strikes ended. In the short term, the railroads had won, and they praised Hayes for his decisive action in dealing with the strikers. Hayes' views on the matter were more nuanced. In his diary, he wrote, quote, The strikes have been put down by force, but now for the real remedy. Can't something be done by education of strikers, by judicious control of capitalists, by wise general policy to end or diminish the evil? The railroad strikers, as a rule, are good men, sober, intelligent, and industrious. Number 3. Hayes is among the 18 presidents who only served a single term despite having the opportunity to run for a second term. In most of these cases, the president failed to get reelected or sometimes even renominated. Hayes didn't even try for a second term. In fact, in his acceptance speech at the Republican National Convention in 1876, he had promised to only serve a single term. Some of his supporters firmly believed a second term was possible. Hayes, however, couldn't be more ready to leave the executive office, describing it as a, quote, life of bondage, responsibility, and toil. While he did enjoy the many privileges and was content with the work he'd done, he looked forward to leaving, quote, as a schoolboy longs for the coming vacation. Other presidents who had promised not to run for a second term include Democrats James K. Polk and James Buchanan. Number 2. At age 30, Hayes had married 21-year-old Lucy Webb. Lucy was outspoken and well-educated. She had a great influence on Hayes' beliefs. Since her youth, she was staunchly opposed to slavery. Her parents had even inherited slaves, but insisted on freeing them rather than selling them, even to their own financial detriment. Hayes had been anti-slavery, but Lucy's stances bolstered his own, encouraging him to use his law practice to defend runaway slaves. She was also a strong advocate for abstinence from alcohol. As such, the Hayes White House was alcohol-free. Hayes enjoyed a happy marriage. In letters to others, he frequently complimented his wife. After Lucy's passing, Hayes said of her, quote, Few men in this most important relation of life have been as blessed as I have been. Number 1. With the end of his term in 1881, Hayes returned to Ohio. He formally retired from politics, though he was still locally active in a military order and in educational efforts. Believing that education was the best way to strengthen the American individual and society at large, he pushed for federal funding for schools. While he supported some higher education, he strongly emphasized practical skills which could be used in the workforce. Disappointed by the mistreatment of African Americans in Ohio, he worked with other educators to try to provide more schooling opportunities. A growing concern for Hayes in his later years was the widening economic gap. Quote, Free government cannot long endure if property is largely in a few hands and large masses of people are unable to earn homes, education, and support in old age. He also commented that Abraham Lincoln wanted a, quote, government for the people, and that more and more the government was becoming, quote, a government of the rich, by the rich, and for the rich. In this same spirit, he continued to advocate for government appointments based on merit and skill rather than political connections. Following a heart attack, Hayes died in 1893 at 70 years old. His final words were, quote, I know that I'm going where Lucy is. 
For a video like this on Hayes' successor, watch the video President James Garfield Facts. To support regular uploads from this channel, consider subscribing and donating to Resyndicated on Patreon. Donations from $2 to $15 a month help towards more frequent uploads. Patreon link in the description below.